Well, it's Easter Sunday morning. It's hard to believe that uh, the year has already advanced to that place. I look forward to Easter time for lots and lots of reasons. Basically because of uh, uh, the, the fact that this is the time that uh, Jesus uh, uh, rose from the grave. This is a time of celebration. This ought to be the happiest time of the year for anyone who knows Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. When you think about uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. This year, Easter seemed to have fallen late on the calendar. Uh, it is that uh, the Easter, as you know, is, uh, falls at a different time every year. It is the first Sunday after the full moon, just following the spring equinox, which means that uh, that's the point that uh, the equator totally lines up with, with, the, sun, with the moon. And uh, at any rate, whoever it is that puts that down and watches that and tells us when that's going to happen, that determines the date of Easter. But I'm glad it's here. How about you? And I'm glad we can serve uh, a risen Savior. So li listen as uh, we go through a little explanation about the, that last week of Christ's life. Go ahead, Bill Jackson. Back it up one. Back it up one more time and then hit it. Well, doesn't look like it's going to play, does it? <laughs> last, last Sunday was Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday was the Sunday that Jesus Christ came riding into the city of Jerusalem. That was a significant time because His riding into the, 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 the city, there was a lot of excitement about Jesus, the one that they had heard of, was coming. As a matter of fact, they were enthusiastic about the fact that Jesus was coming. So people lined the road outside the city of Jerusalem. Now Jesus had sent his disciples in to go and find a colt of a donkey. They brought this colt of a donkey for him to ride in. Now understand that the people who lined the road outside here, they were expecting Jesus to come and be their, their Savior, their, their conquering King. They were expecting Him to go into the city of Jerusalem and to confront the Roman officials, those that had uh, that they were subjected to their power, those who had overrun and take them out of their homeland, they were expecting Jesus to come in and to, to to overthrow physically the government and set up a new government. And they hear this Messiah has come, and they're so excited. They line the rows. They 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 holler hallelujah. They they put the palm leaves out. They take their coats off and. Excuse me. Lay it down on the road as they would do for a king, a conquering king. But the problem was, these Jews were expecting a physical king. Even the disciples really were expecting a physical king at this time. They didn't understand the spiritual nature of what Christ was all about, what the message was all about. So there they were as He came. And the crowds cheered and they, they hollered and they were so excited to see Jesus. This conquering hero coming in on a colt of a donkey instead of a white horse like a conquering king. Well as He came in, He sent my head to find the upper room. And in the upper room it was that they were to secure that location. As they secured that location, they would uh, Jesus would come, and there they would celebrate the Passover together. They came and they secured the upper room, and they went in, and Jesus came to eat the Passover meal. While they were eating the Passover meal, and the Passover meal was just a typical meal like every every other Jew in the city was eating at the time. But while they were eating the Passover meal, several things happened. One of them was that Jesus told them again that He was about to leave them. And as He 
would go away from them, that He would come again and receive them unto Himself, that where He was, there they could be also. And they said, Lord, you know, how do we know where You're going? If we don't know where You're going, how can we know how to get there? And so, so Jesus reminds them that He's the way, the truth, and the life. They still don't understand it. They still can't see beyond the physical to the spiritual. You know, as I was thinking about that this week and putting this together, we still that way, aren't we? It's hard for us to see beyond what we can physically touch and what we physically can put our hands on. It's hard for us to see the spiritual side. It's hard to, to, to be reminded of and to know that we serve a living King. And we do. But He was in the upper room. They were eating the, the Passover meal. Jesus asked the blessing. And after He asked the blessing, He grabbed uh, His, his uh, bread and He tore off pieces and passed it around. And He said, Take and eat. This is My body that's been broken for you. This do in remembrance of, of Me. Remember it hadn't happened. The disciples still don't know what's going on. And they can't fully comprehend. They know all the excitement in the air. They know the, Jew, the Roman officials and the Jewish Sanhedrin, they don't like Jesus. They want Him put to death. But they still don't understand what He's saying. So they eat together. Then He takes the cup. Fruit of the vine. And He tells them to drink. And they drink. And He tells them that that is to remind Him of, of, of His blood. They still don't understand it's about to be spilled, but it's about to be spilled. Then He takes the bread and He, he tells Judas, He said, the, the one who, who eats this bread. Actually, He did that before the Lord's Supper, but He said the one that would eat this bread is the one that's going to betray Me. And He turned to Judas and it was customary because their bread typically was very, very hard that they dipped it into an olive oil solution before they ate it to make it softer to eat. So the, the one who, who he gave the salt to, the one he dipped it in the olive oil and handed it to, this was the one that was going to betray him. And Judas took and he ate. And Jesus told him, go and do what you got to do. And do it quickly. So he left. Still Thursday, Monday, Thursday. He went outside and went to do what he came to do, and that was to, uh, to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. After they discussed and after they talked, and Jesus shared some things with them, the Bible says that they sang a song, and then they left the upper room, and they started out, and they came outside the upper room and went down the, the city, outside the city gates, and they went across the Kidron Valley and began to go up on the side of the Mount of Olives. Now on the Mount of Olives, it's called the Mount of Olives because there were great olive groves that grew all around the tree. They grew those beautiful olives. And there was an olive press right in the center. This was a place of tranquility. It was like a, a, a city park. People would come out there and they'd sit underneath these olive trees and they would meditate, they would think, and they would pray. And, and there they would relax from all that was going on in the city. We are told that Jesus went there very often. He would go there and meditate. This time it was different. As they came up to the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told His disciples to stop and to wait. So they stopped and they waited. As they stopped and as they waited, His three closest buddies came on a few steps further and they went into the garden. And Jesus told them, Guys, my heart is heavy. Y'all stay here and pray for a period of time. And Jesus went. Now I thought about this a lot of times about Jesus praying uh, there by Himself in the garden. Why that was necessary? Well, I think everything He did was necessary, right? He did it for a reason. But I think that the biggest reason that Jesus did that and had it included in the Bible is He wanted us to understand His hum humanity. <laughs> that He was very much God, but He was very much man. He felt every physical pain that was about to come on Him as He went to the cross. He knew the tremendous weight and pressure, emotional pressure 
that was about to be put on him as through the, the next few hours going through that series of trials. And it was heavy on his heart. And you know something that tells us when it's heavy on our heart? We need to carry it to Jesus, don't we? Because He understands exactly what's going on. But He prayed. Went back and they were asleep. and Went back prayed three times. After he prayed three times, he came out and said, come on guys, the guards are coming to get me. Let's go down to me. So they start into the garden. The guards led by Judas come into the garden. Still Thursday afternoon. The guards come into the garden. Judas leading. And Judas comes up and he greets him like we shake with a handshake. It was the the, the Asian style to, to, to greet each other with a kiss. And so he comes up and he kisses him. And then he walks back. Well, a lot of things happened there. You remember Peter when he saw the guards coming in with the, the guard with the, the sword drawn? He, he cuts the ear off of one of the guards. And Jesus takes his ear off. If they have a Video in heaven. I hope that's one of the things that we get to see, one of the videos we get to see. But Jesus picks up the ear and He puts it back on and, and heals it. You know, that one thing looks to me like would cause any of those guards to believe, wouldn't it? But it didn't because they weren't seeking. But He puts the ear on. And then they take Him and they arrest Him. And for a period of time, they are there and they go through a series of trials. Now, Miss Bonnie's going to come and lead us in uh, the, the verses of In the Garden. Let's stand together and sing the, this song. I come to the garden.
be seated. Well, they carried him through a series of six different trials that night, all of which were illegal. They paid different witnesses to come and say, Jesus did things that He did not do. They brought Him through and through a series of time, trying to stretch the time back still Thursday afternoon. They carried Him before Pilate. It was Pilate's tradition that he would ask the crowd the Jews to appease the Jews exactly who they would have Him to release and then He would release one of the prisoners. So the crowd, he knew that Jesus was not guilty of anything. He knew that the charges of blasphemy and the charges that were brought that, that Jesus had not done. So he wanted to appease the Jews. He didn't want to make them mad. So he came and had a, 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 a rebel, one who was accused of murder trying to overthrow the Roman government. He had this murderer brought out named Barabbas and he brought him out on his balcony and he and Jesus were there with him on the balcony. And he says to the crowd, he said, uh, uh, who would you have me release? Would you have me release this, the king of the Jews, the one that calls himself the king of the Jews? Or, or would you have me release Barabbas? Well, you know the story from the Bible that the crowds hollered out, Barabbas, Barabbas! He knew he wasn't, that Jesus wasn't guilty, that this wasn't right. So Pilate says, now, what would you have me do with the king of the Jews? And they begin to yell. Now before they start yelling, the Sanhedrin, the high priest, are in the crowd. You know there's always somebody in the crowd, right? And they begin to instigate, and they, they begin to holler, crucify, crucify getting louder and louder and, and moving amongst the crowd and soon the crowd joins in and soon there's a glowing echo of a sound of people hollering, crucify Him! Crucify Him! Crucify Him! So Pilate delivered Jesus to the crowd to be crucified and released Barabbas, the murderer, even though he was guilty of crimes worthy of a crucifixion. Well, you know the story of how they, they took Jesus and how they beat him and how he carried him, came back and he had the top the cross, piece of the cross and his hands on it. It got so heavy that he couldn't hold it and so they came and uh, one from the crowd came and held his hands and they carried him all the way up to the place of Calvary. There they secured that, that top piece to the the, the, uh, the part that went up and down, the, the horizontal piece, and there as they secured it and nailed his, his hands into the bar and then nailed his feet into the bar and then placed him there and through a series of times. Jesus spoke seven times while He was on the cross. And finally, by this time it was Friday, at, it was Friday morning. It was Friday Got Jesus in place on the cross. Friday evening, Jesus died on the cross. After He died on the cross, Joseph, a rich man, he was a believer, this rich man came and he asked the Roman officials, could he have the body of Jesus to bury? They verified that Jesus was dead. They needed to get him off of the cross before sundown because Passover was about to start and it would create quite a, a, a disturbance among the Jews. So they gave the body to Joseph. Joseph had a tomb and tombs were very expensive because they were cut out of a rock. And where it was cut out of a rock uh, and then a big piece of rock was fitted to go over the outside or over the opening of it. It cost a lot of money because there was a lot of labor to do it. But Joseph carried the body or took the body off of the cross and there he and friends and probably some of his servants, they took fresh, new, expensive linen and wrapped the body of Jesus in it. And then they carried the body and they, they laid it inside the tomb. After they laid the body inside the tomb, we are told that the Roman soldiers went ahead and put the stone in front of the, 
the, the, the grave in front of the tomb. That was a little unusual. Usually they would leave the, the stone out, uh, away from the opening until after the body had been prepared for burial. And the reason was is that this huge stone was so terribly uh, heavy. Estimates say it must have weighed between one and a half tons and two tons because the opening would have been about four and a half to five feet overall size and to have a big stone that would cover that plus a little bit more it would have to be a massive stone so this huge stone that would take a, a whole uh, army of men as well as equipment to move it into place so the Roman army moved it into place as if that wasn't enough then they put a seal, a wax seal all the way around the outside where it sealed up against the outside of the, the rock on, on the tomb. As if that wasn't enough, they put two, stop, two uh, soldiers outside the tomb. Now they, that was overkill normally, right? I mean that two ton rock, who's going to move that two ton rock? Well, that the rock was in place, it was sealed, the guards were there. I think Jesus did that because I think God has a sense of humor. Matter of fact, looking at some of y'all, I know He does. <laughs> but, but that rock in His place, and it was absolutely secure. Who could move that rock? The seal was around it, and guards were there. Absolutely impossible for anyone to get inside except for God, right? right? So the picture is, or the story goes on, that this uh, these during early on Sunday morning, Jesus was in the ground before Passover on Friday, all Friday night and all day Saturday, and then early on all day Saturday night, and then early on Sunday morning, the the some of the women, the two Marys and other women, they came in order to to uh, anoint the body with with fresh herbs, which was the custom. Women would do that to family members and people that they loved to prepare their body so it would last longer inside the tomb. And after that, they would seal it. We know that they were concerned about what was going to happen when they got there because they saw the Romans seal the tomb. One of them said to the other one, what are we going to do when we get there? How are we going to move that stone? The other one, huh? That may not be an exact translation there. But Mark records that conversation. They talked about the rock and how it was going to be moved and it couldn't be moved. But they went on anyway. And they came to the tomb. And when they came to the tomb, look at, at, at Luke chapter 24, verse 1. When they came to the tomb there early on the first morning, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women, they being Mary and Mary, and certain other women with them, came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. This is really interesting. In Mark, you always picture, and we see pictures, of how the stone is just rolled a little bit away from the opening, just enough to get inside. That's not the way it was. If you go into Mark's Gospel and look at it, the way it was, it tells us that this stone was moved completely over away, away from where the tomb was. So God picked this two-toned stone up. He didn't just gently roll it away. He moved it completely away from the scene of where the tomb was. Amen. It was a miracle. But you understand this miracle was that God didn't roll this stone away or move it away from the scene in order that Jesus could get out. Jesus was bound and limit. Fine limit. We're going to see in just a minute that when they looked inside the tomb, that linen was just laying there. Now I think it still had the impression of his body. Folded, but, but still the, the impression of his body. I don't know. But he was released from the, the 
fabric from, from the linen. He didn't need the stone to move to get out because he was already out, right? Matter of fact, a little later you'll find him coming into the upper room and he just appears there, doesn't he? Where they, they're having church service and he just comes into the... the they had the doors closed because they were afraid for their lives and Jesus just appears inside the room. He didn't need the stone to roll away. The stone was rolled away <coughs> so that these humans could come and stick their head in and know that He was gone. I think it's interesting here that these women came. They were expecting the body of Jesus. They were going to anoint Him. But they came anyway. Their faith was shaken. They had seen Jesus die on the cross. They knew He was dead. They had seen Him place Him inside the tomb. They knew He had been buried. Probably the longest day in history was that Saturday between the Friday night when He was placed in the tomb and Sunday morning when they got to the tomb. Can you imagine all those disciples, what they were thinking? Jesus had walked with them, talked with them. Jesus had been their leader. Jesus had been instructing them, had been there all along the way. Can you imagine that they're shaken in their faith? Exactly what are we going to do now? What does this mean to us? Are they going to turn on us? Are they going to come and get us? Is there a price on our head? What do we need to do about meeting together? All these questions. I thought as I was studying that, you know, that is just human nature to, to, to think those things. Have you ever had those kind of Saturdays? Not literally Saturday, Saturday, but somewhere between the promise of God and the fulfillment of God. Have you ever had those times where it was where something was going on in your life and you knew God would take care of it, you knew He was in control, but you didn't know how and you didn't know when and you didn't know where that would carry you to for that fulfillment to come. Those Saturdays can be long and hard and drawn out. Well, that's where they were. But these women whose faith had been shook, their love was absolutely secure. They didn't care who knew. They loved Jesus. And they came to anoint the body. So they came. Then verse 3. Then they went in and did not find the body of Jesus. He wasn't there. They were expecting to see Him. But He wasn't there. Look on down to verses 5 and 6. This is neat. Right before verse 5 and verse 4, it talks about the angels coming. And the angels as they come, they just appear beside these women. Can you imagine being there? Being unsure of what's going to happen, all the events that's been transpired, and now they come in and, and His body's there, not really sure what's going on. And, and there these angels just appear. And you've got to know that they're angels. So they appear to, to them. And then as they were afraid, talking about the women, and bowed their faces to the earth, they, talking about the angels, said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how He spoke to you when He was still in Galilee. Those angels were saying, why are you surprised? Why did you come expecting to find Jesus buried in the tomb? I know you saw Him going in there, but weren't you listening? He told you over and over and over again. He told you that He was going to die and be buried and on the third day He was going to rise again. There's one Scripture that tells us that Jesus said that it was like uh, the Jonah in the belly of the whale. And on the third day, He would, would come forth again. It was that Jesus said that it was like the, the temple, that one day the temple would be destroyed, but on the third day it would be rebuilt again. They thought He was talking about Herod's temple, but He was talking about Him. The prophecy was, I'm coming back, I'm going to be, I'm going to be killed, but I am coming back. So why... Are you amazed? Have you ever been amazed when God answers a prayer and you thought He was going to answer it? I mean, I have. I just stand back in amazement sometimes. Wow! Look what God has done! And the whole time I wasn't sure. And even sometimes making excuses in your mind why it's not going to be done. But the angel said, Why? 
Are you looking for the living among the dead? Well, it goes on. Saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. And they remembered the teachings that they had heard. Then they returned from the tomb and told all the, these things to the eleven and to all the rest. I think it's kind of significant. It's the women who come first and discover this. They come. I'm not real sure where the men were trying to make plans of what they're going to do now, but the women come. and Well, it, it was pretty traditional that the women would take care of the, the, the body for burial, but here they come. And they come back to the men. Now understand, these are eyewitnesses, these women... But a woman's word held nothing in a court of law. She could not testify in a court because she was not legally a person. Isn't that terrible? In this day and time. So they come back into the men and they say, you won't believe this, but we just went to the tomb and Jesus is not there. Well, the men begin making excuses why they don't believe. But Peter and John, so we'll go, we're going to go and find out. So they left and they start running to the tomb. Now John's the kind of guy that has to, can't be beat on anything. I mean, he's very competitive in nature. Remember one time John said that he was the beloved of Jesus, that he was the one most beloved of Jesus. Very competitive in nature. He, they're out there running. And old John just, just passes Peter and runs in and he runs up ahead and he runs right on into the tomb. And Peter comes up and he kind of stops on the outside. But John just jumps right on into the tomb. And when he gets there, he finds out they were telling the truth. He's not here. People have tried to disprove the resurrection, but you understand that the day that Jesus rose from the dead grave was the birth of the Christian religion. It was the birth of the Christian faith that we have. It is the basis by which our faith is built on. If it were not for the resurrection, we would have absolutely no hope at all. Zero. Teaching of the cross is very important. Jesus fulfilled prophecy by going to the cross. But you understand, many, many men died on crosses. As a matter of fact, history tells us that right before Jesus died on the cross, there were 200 men and women who, who were killed by the Romans on the crosses because they, they, they had betrayed the Romans or felt like they had betrayed the Romans. And they were so mad, they just left their bodies on the cross until they smelled so bad you couldn't even walk down the road around it. They wanted everybody to see and be reminded, this is what we do to traitors. Many men died on crosses. But the distinction is that Jesus died on the cross. He wasn't guilty of anything. He had done nothing. Gone through six trials and, and they, they, they accused Him of things that He didn't do. But, but now hanging on the cross and dying on the cross, the difference between He and all the other people who died on crosses was the fact that on the third morning, He rose from the grave. Amen. So you understand this. There is positively nothing impossible for God. The very basis of our faith is built on what we celebrate this Sunday morning. What we celebrate, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's alive! Amen. And because He's alive, your sins are forgiven. Jesus paid the price on the cross of Calvary for our sins. He died to pay the price. But on Sunday morning when He rose again, it was accepted. His offering was accepted. It was God's verification that, that the process had been completed. That the price had been paid. That the, all sins blotted out for those who had placed their faith and trust in Jesus. So if you're here today and you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, you can write it down in stone that your sins have been forgiven and you are a child of God for what Jesus did and the, the fact that His sacrifice was accepted. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord for what Jesus has done for us. 
not only does it mean the forgiveness of our sins, it means that we got hope. Man, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world around us, right? Man, there's so much tension and so much stress. There's so the, just just living is hard. But if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you know that you have somebody inside of you that's far, far greater than all the stress of this whole world. Right? you got a part of Jesus living in there, the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. That's always with you. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He did. Whatever you are facing, He knows about. Whatever it is piling on top of you, He's very much aware of whatever decisions you are facing. He knows what those decisions are and He knows what needs to happen. So relax. Don't worry. Give it to the Lord and then make yourself available to be used by Him. He will give you the strength and the direction and all you need because on the third day, He had power over death. He had the power to come forth from the tomb. And not only here in the present do we have hope, but we have the promise of a future. Right? I know, I don't know how long Jesus will leave me here on this earth. I mean, He may take me this afternoon. But I know when that time comes, the Bible says that's an appointment every one of us is going to face. It's appointed unto man once to die. When that appointment time comes, I know that the angels will come and take my soul out of my body immediately and I'm going home to Jesus. I know that because on the third day He rose from the grave. He showed me that He had power over death. Death could not contain Him. So when He tells me that I will live for eternity, I know He has the power to do it. The Bible also tells us that he was the first fruit. And the first fruit just means that this is the first fruit to come onto the tree that means that there's a crop coming along. So what that means is, He says to you, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, He says, write it down in stone, you're coming to Me when you die. Just as I came back to the Father, you're coming to Me when you die. So why do we spend so much time in work and so beat down with stress? Be concerned about what's going on. Do the best you can. Spend a lot of time in prayer. Listen to God's direction in your life. But live in the fullness and joy of what it means to know the one true God who rose again on the third day. And let that be your power. So here's a question and I'm through, okay? Do you know that you know that you're saved? Do you know beyond any shadow of a doubt if you were to die right now, you're on the way to heaven? If you don't know that, why? It's so simple. Ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your heart to forgive you of your sins if you know that you have sinned and every one of you have. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins and believe Him with complete unquestioning faith. He's going to do what He says He do. He showed us He had the power to do it. He's going to do what He says He's going to do and He will save you where you are. Let's stand. If I can come to lead the invitation, God is speaking to your heart. I invite you to come as we sing together.